restriction, restriction and modifications at Bangkok Hospital today. Uh, before we start lecture, may I ask for your kind please turn off your mobile phone during the lecture. To open the program, we are pleased to invite Mr. Curtis J. Schroeder, Chief Executive Officer of the Hospital, to welcome and open it. Please. So, good morning. Uh, I'm very pleased today to uh, welcome Dr. Roberts and the uh, International Peace Foundation joining us today for this uh, very interesting lecture. Um, if this is part of Bumagrad Hospital's commitment to bringing uh, top-level continuing medical education uh, to the medical community here in Thailand. And so we'd very much like to, uh, to welcome you all on behalf of Bumagrad Hospital. Today we have uh, uh, medical staff from both here at Bumagrad Hospital, uh, guests from Chulalongkorn and other universities here uh, in Thailand, also from uh, pharmaceutical companies, research interests, and, and others joining us today. So it's quite a, an interesting crowd. Uh, before I introduce uh, Dr. Roberts, I wanted to talk a little bit about our partner here in uh, uh, bringing this lecture to you today. It's the International Peace Foundation, and we're joined today by Mr. Uwe Borowitz, who uh, is the chairman of uh, the International Peace Foundation. It's quite interesting what they're doing here uh, in Thailand. Uh, the International Peace Foundation is a nonprofit organization that uh, acts as a pool, offering its network of organizations, Nobel laureates, artists, and leaders in all parts of society to support peace and education projects of existing Thai institutions and enterprises with contacts and knowledge. Uh, under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics, and in cooperation with various national and international organizations, institutions, and enterprises, the International Peace Foundation will host uh, the event series called Bridges, the Dialogues Towards a, a Culture of Peace in Bangkok between uh, November of last year and April of this year, and again, uh, November of this year to uh, April of next year. There are actually three Nobel laureates in medicine are invited to visit Bangkok this year, of uh, which uh, Dr. Roberts won today, and we're very honored to have uh, Dr. Roberts with us today. Um, as I look through uh, the autobiography of, uh, of Dr. Roberts, uh, it would probably take me an hour and a half to go through everything he's done. It would leave him only five minutes to talk. So I'm going to give you some brief ideas. But in looking at his autobiography, I found it quite interesting that uh, his first job interest was to be a detective. Uh, and one of his uh, most interesting uh, things he likes to do is uh, figure out puzzles and video games. Now, I can't think of any better type of personality to take on probably today's biggest puzzle in the world today, which is unraveling the genome. And many of you have followed, uh, certainly in the, in the press and in, uh, in the medical journals, about the unraveling and the sequencing of RNA and the DNA and the genome project. Well, we're sitting here with us today with someone who, in 1993, won the Nobel Prize for Medicine that established some of the very first uh, tools to be used in that project. So I think it's very, very appropriate that we have Dr. Roberts with us today. Dr. Roberts is a research director at the New England Biolabs in Beverly, Massachusetts. Originally from England, he was educated uh, at the University of Sheffield, where he got his bachelor's in chemistry and later his PhD in organic chemistry. Uh, his postdoctoral research was carried out uh, in uh, Professor uh, Strominger's laboratory at Harvard, Massachusetts, where he studied uh, tRNAs that are involved in the biosynthesis of bacterial cell walls. From 1972 to 1992, he worked at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, reaching the position of assistant director for research under Dr. Watson. He began work on the newly discovered type 2 restriction enzymes in 19, 1972, and in the next few years, more than 100 such enzymes were discovered and characterized in Dr. Roberts' laboratory. Dr. Roberts has also been involved in studies in the adenovirus 2 and discovered split genes in mRNA splicing in 1977, for which he received the Nobel Prize in Physics or Medicine in 1993. His laboratory sequenced the 35,937 nucleotide adenovirus 2 genome and wrote some of the first programs for sequence assembly and analysis. DNA methyltransferases are an area of active research interest, and in collaboration with Dr. Cheng, DNA-based flipping was discovered in 1993. Current interest focus is on the identification and restriction enzyme and methylase genes within the GenBank database and the development of rapid methods to assay their function. 
Now, I'm just glad that one of my minors in school was biochemistry, otherwise I probably never would have made it the introduction. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I hope that you uh, look forward as much as I do to, uh, to Dr. Roberts' uh, uh, talk. And without further ado, I'd like to in introduce uh, Nobel Prize laureate, Dr. Richard Roberts. The idea is to set up a system whereby every journal, whoever um, sends an article to a journal, will actually pay ahead of time to have it published, so that as soon as it's published, it's freely available over the World Wide Web to anybody who wants it. And I must say, I'm a very strong advocate of this and working hard towards it. I'm actually editor of a journal called Nucleic Acids Research, and we are moving as fast as we can to make our journal completely open access. And we hope that by January of next year, if all goes well, we will be able to do that. Um, anybody who wants to know more about this, uh, the Public Library of Sciences, the web address is up there. And this is a, a group that is both publishing journals and also supporting the open access movement. PubMed Central is a central archive that is held at the National Library of Medicine um, www.pubmedcentral.nih.gov and already there are many, many journal articles that are freely available there once you get them, you can download them, print them, do whatever you want with them, um, they're up for everybody. But what I'm really going to talk about today, uh, a long time love of mine, and that is restriction enzymes and DNA methyl transferases. What I want to do is to introduce you, if you don't already know what restriction enzymes are, to a little bit about these enzymes. I'll tell you something of the, their biology. These enzymes have had an unbelievable impact on biological research. In fact, there would be no biotechnology industry today without these enzymes. They are so important that people, most people have actually forgotten um, that there was a time when we didn't have them. Most people just think of them as laboratory reagents. You, you order them from a catalog and away they come. And people have really forgotten about the, the biology of these enzymes and the biochemistry and so on. And so I hope that by the end of this lecture, I will convince you that these are really very interesting, very fascinating enzymes. First slide, please. Now, in order to, oh, sorry, I should do that, don't I? So in order to give you some idea of what they're doing biologically, many, not quite all, but almost all bacteria have within them enzymes that are capable of cutting up DNA in a sequence-specific manner. These things are called restriction enzymes, and the phenomenon of restriction takes place when a bacteriophage tries to infect a bacterium. And what it does, first of all, is to inject the DNA into the bacterium. And the bacteria typically will have one of these enzymes, shown here by this little cartoon figure, <coughs> that really serves as scissors to cut the DNA wherever this sequence occurs. And in this way, the bacterium can protect itself to some extent against the action of bacteriophages. Now, of course, there is a, an obvious potential problem here, and that is that the bacterial cell has within it one action of the restriction enzyme, it would actually chop up its own DNA and kill itself. And in order to prevent that, the bacteria that has a restriction enzyme comes along with a companion enzyme that will modify the DNA by selectively methylating, putting a methyl group onto the sequence that is recognized by the restriction enzyme. So that in real life, in a typical bacterium, what happens is that we have a restriction modification system in which when phage DNA is injected into the cell, the restriction enzyme and the DNA methyl transferase, the modification enzyme, will compete to act upon this DNA. Now typically, these enzymes recognize relatively short sequences, 
And that means that in a typical bacteriophage DNA, there will be many such sites. And so because it takes the methylase many hits in order to be able to protect the DNA completely, the restriction enzyme will usually find an unmodified site before the DNA modification enzyme has a chance to methylate everything and thus protect it. And so for this reason, it is called a restriction system. It's not an absolute uh, thing. It doesn't completely destroy all the DNA, but most of the time it does. And so in this case, uh, you get restriction, and phages destroy, the bacterium can live by having.